Hello, my name is Jennifer kern and I'm one of the co-authors of a manuscript entitled Long-Term Tolerability of Once-Monthly Injectable Paliperidone Palmitate in Subjects with Recently Diagnosed Schizophrenia. In patients with schizophrenia, the first 5 to 10 years of illness is a critical period for effective intervention to prevent deterioration and optimize outcomes. However, patients are often non-adherent with their antipsychotic medication. The use of long-acting injectable antipsychotic agents may be an appropriate option for these patients. Long-acting injectable agents remove the need to remember to take daily medication and their long half-lives provide a wide window for missed doses before plasma levels become subtherapeutic. However, the use of these agents may pose tolerability concerns for clinicians and patients. While patients early in their illness are often responsive to antipsychotic treatment, they may be sensitive to adverse effects, such as extrapyramidal symptoms, weight gain, prolactin-related effects, and sedation. In this manuscript, my co-investigators and I examine this issue in a post-hoc analysis of an international trial of the long-acting injectable antipsychotic paliperidone palmitate. In this study, 645 subjects received continuous treatment with paliperidone palmitate. In this flow chart, we see that 216 were categorized as having recently diagnosed schizophrenia, meaning that their diagnosis was within the last five years. 429 had a longer duration of diagnosis and were referred to as the chronic illness subgroup. In both groups, the mean monthly dose was 109 milligrams, and the continuous mean exposure to paliperidone palmitate was 334 days in the recently diagnosed and 309 days in the chronic illness group. We examined all reported adverse events as well as measures of extrapyramidal symptoms, glucose, prolactin, and body weight in the two subgroups. First, we examined the percentages of subjects in each subgroup who reported any adverse event from the time of the first injection to the completion of specific time points, and found that during the month following the first injection, 31.5% of recently diagnosed and 42.7% of those in the chronic illness subgroup reported an adverse event. In general, the incidence rates at these intervals suggested that adverse events were less likely in the recently diagnosed subgroup than in the chronically ill subgroup. In our assessment of individual adverse events, those occurring at a 2% or greater margin between the recently diagnosed and chronic illness subgroups were identified. We then determined the relative risks and 95% confidence intervals for these events. Events considered potentially significant between groups were those in which the 95% confidence interval did not include one. Using these criteria, nasopharyngitis was a potentially significant event reported in more chronically ill than recently diagnosed subjects at months 6, 9, 12, and endpoint. Influenza and amenorrhea were potentially significant events reported in more recently diagnosed than chronically ill subjects at endpoint. This figure illustrates these data at the overall study endpoint. With the exception of nasopharyngitis that occurred in more chronically ill than recently diagnosed subjects, and influenza and amenorrhea that occurred in more recently diagnosed than chronically ill subjects, there were no other events considered potentially significant between the subgroups. We then examined rates of any extrapyramidal symptom events and found these to be numerically lower in the recently diagnosed subgroup at each time period, with these ranging from 2.3% to 9.3% in the recently diagnosed subgroup and from 5.8% to 12.6% in the chronically ill subgroup. In an evaluation of specific individual extrapyramidal symptom-related preferred terms, we found, as summarized in this next table, that two occurred at a 2% or greater margin between groups. Among the specific preferred terms, 
nonspecific extrapyramidal disorder was reported by more recently diagnosed subjects and akathisia was reported by more chronically ill subjects. Weight changes and glucose-related measures appeared similar between the subgroups. In our assessment of changes from baseline and prolactin levels, we found, as summarized in this table, that there were increases in both sexes in both subgroups, with greater increases observed in females than in males in each subgroup. Also, prolactin levels were higher in females with early illness compared to females with more chronic illness. In an analysis of potentially prolactin-related events, we found, as summarized in this next table, that the rate of prolactin-related events was 7.9% in those with a more recent diagnosis and 3.5% in those with more chronic illness. To summarize, we found in this post-hoc analysis of a multi-phase study that the long-term tolerability of paliperidone palmitate was generally similar in recently diagnosed schizophrenia subjects and in those with more chronic illness, with the exception of some prolactin-related measures. We hope that these findings will be useful to help guide clinicians in the management of patients early in the course of their illness.